Welcome to What Life Cyber. Today I am going to talk to you real quick about SOC 2 Type 2, how to read SOC 2 Type 2. If you have been a third party risk analyst for a while, you know that one of the documents, one of the artifacts that you review is SOC 2 Type 2. So, real quickly, I'm going to show you it's, um, it's a documentation that can be range from 20 pages to 120 pages. So usually if you're assessing more than one um, vendor, which is usually the case, then you don't have time to read everything. So I'm going to show you a very quick um, trick to just scheme through it, get what you need. And if you have time down the road, you can go ahead, go, go back and read the entire documentation if you want. But when you get SOC 2 type 2, the first thing you're going to look for is who prepared it. You know, there are acceptable SOC 2 type 2s that I think you can just put in some information in a software and then it will create a SOC 2 type 2 for you. Those are not reliable because then you're going to pass every control test and right. But it should come from an external party that's more trusted, right? If it's coming from KPMG, if it's coming from um, PCW, Christ, what a PWC, or any, it doesn't have to be these famous ones. I'm only using the famous ones because it's easier to relate. But it can come from anyone. There's Showman. There are so many. I've seen so many small companies and big external auditors do these things, and they are all acceptable as long as it's not the company assessing themselves. There is internal audit, but that's a story for another day. Let me not digress. So you look to see who prepared the SOC 2 Type 2, and then you look to you look at the date to see if it's, um, it hasn't expired. You need an updated one on file. So SOC 2 Type 2s are always one year duration. And once that one year has ended, you have three months to prepare for another year. So the dates, so right now, if you request for SOC 2 Type 2, we are in, what month is this? April, May, March? We are in March. So when you get, if you get a SOC 2 Type 2 that ended December 31st, 2022, it's still okay because you will have a gap letter. It takes three months to go through external audit. So you will have three months from January to March, that kind of a leeway. This is the preparation time. So you can request for a gap letter to put on file. And that's also another a story for another day. Or you can have a current, um, a current SOC 2 type 2 and the date for the current one is going to be January 2022 to December 2022. Yes, you're always preparing for the year that has already passed. So you will, the, the SOC 2 is going to be January 2022, January 1, 2022 to December 31st. 2022. It's, it always begin with the first of the month and the last day of the month. It doesn't have to be January to December. It can be March to the following year, February. It doesn't have to. So for us, it's one year duration. Actually, I have seen companies do six months month duration. I bet you there is quarterly as well for all those advanced rich companies. They can afford to do these things. But Typically, it should be at least once a year. So you can, if it has expired, you should request for a gap letter or a gap or bridge letter is used interchangeably, but a, yeah, or an updated um, SOC 2 type 2. You still, you can still use the expired one for your analysis, but it's not reliable until you get an updated one. So make a note, or if you use a good GLC, set a reminder to set a request for the vendor to provide an updated SOC report or a gap letter. The gap letter always says that we are in the process of updating or we are in audit process. So a SOC 2 type 2 will be available once it's done, blah, 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 blah. But so you check the date to make sure that it's, it hasn't expired. The SOC 2 hasn't expired. I don't know if they expire or it's not out of date. It's up updated. One year interval, all right? And then once you are done with that, I will check the 
scope. Yes, I will check the scope just to skim through. If you already have been working with the vendor for a while, you already know the scope. Just make sure nothing has changed and, you know, they are still providing the services that they say they will provide. Sometimes if I am crunched with time, I don't even read the scope. Don't follow me. Always read the scope to see if anything changed. And if it's a new vendor, we still read the scope to see if, um, the SOW has the same scope as the SOC 2 type 2. And then once I am done, I scroll way down. If it's 100 pages, I go way down till I see kind of a table or an Excel sheet with three columns. The control name, description, testing results. Or control name, description, testing, testing results. So it's going to be four columns. And what this is where... This is where your work comes in. You're going to look at all the controls. If it's 100 controls, if it's 200 controls, if it's 300 controls, you're going to look at all the testing they did and see which ones have exceptions and which ones don't have exceptions. Exception equals failed. They, we don't use failed or pass because all the testing is done on samples. So you can't necessarily say the system failed be, because if and they have uh, 15,000 employees and you're only testing 300 of them. You can't necessarily say it failed, but you can say there is an exception. But as an auditor or as a third party risk analyst, put in mind that exception means failed or exception means concern. Exception means findings. Exception means ding, 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 ding. Oh, I think my, I'm cutting off my head, but the, the important thing is you can hear me. Anyway, so once you go through it and with this one i still really skim through it because that column the control testing column will have no exception no exception you don't care about the ones that say no exception so i skim through real quick because some of these controls can be a lot so i skim through real quick till i see an exception and you will see it because once they have an exception instead of just no exception which is two words it will have a whole bunch of sentences because the auditor will put what their findings so they can easily say oh of all the password of all the employees we tested they will actually give you the number of the 10 employees we tested three of them were not terminated on time so in this case it's an exception you log it down you type it somewhere or right away if you're a type a person right away you email you put it in the system to send request for artifact or you're listening somewhere or you're just making a mental note it doesn't matter how you approach this so you go through and you try to find all the exceptions if they are a good company they will have about three or four or five if they are troublesome they are probably going to have a lot and that means more work right so you have listed all your findings any exception is a findings you have listed all your findings and usually what i do is i list the control that failed we are not saying failed. The controls that are findings that didn't pass or didn't, um, that have exceptions. And then, so I will list it, password complexity. And then I will type exactly what, actually I'm lazy. I just take a screenshot of it and save it somewhere. But you should type it somewhere so that you can keep track. And then this is where I'm going to follow up, but we're not going to follow up yet. We will go down, once you finish the controls testing section, you will go down at the bottom and get management response. This means the external auditor, I'm going to use KPMG as an example. KPMG, after they got all the exceptions, sat down with the company, the leaders of the company, and said, these are the, the, the exceptions we found. And for this tutorial, I'm going to say, these are the, the controls that failed our testing. They won't say fail. They will say, these are the exceptions we found. And what is your response? So you're going to read because sometimes there's a mistake. Sometimes the people who were terminated, um, my previous company, someone was terminated at five o'clock on Friday. They, they didn't come out of the system until Monday. And that was an exception because that was a whole 72 hours. But our policy said that we will terminate them in the system right away. But they were terminated after hours. Something happened. I actually know the story. Something happened and then they were let go. But it was after hours. 
So even though a ticket was put in, nobody did anything until Monday. So in this case, it's going to say an exception. It's going to say fail, but it really didn't fail. Well, it failed, but um, so that was the management response. If you are a third party analyst, this is a good response, right? So you will tell them to kind of let show you proof and they're going to show you the date where they're going to send you a screenshot of when they were let go and when they were deleted from the system or access was um, taken away from the system. And the screenshot will tell you, you will go on the calendar and say, oh, true, they were terminated at, at 501, the company closes at five. They were terminated at 501 and then in the in HR, but they, their access was denied. Mind you, everyone that's terminated, once they hit the terminate button or they put in a ticket, they their account is disabled. But you still have to go into the system to start for another, another day. But so an exception like this, when you read the manager's response, it's up to you and your boss to decide, oh, it's not a big deal. Or the management response can say, oh, at the time that the testing was being made, that same time we were mitigating. In this case, they will still send an artifact saying that this was mitigated. Let's say it was a change control and they will say of all the new applications that came on board, developers did not go through the normal change request um, process. In this case, managers can say, oh, that's true. Okay, we will change. So it is a a risk at this point right so managers have accepted but this was done a year ago or this was done for last year so can you show me mitigation steps what have you done since then to make sure this doesn't happen again and they will walk you through it so it's up to you and your boss to decide whether you want to accept or not and then another example is um i want to give a very simple example Oh, they will say that in your policy, you say that access is not granted to um, anyone outside the U.S. But we realize that some people in India are accessing regularly. Then manager's response said, we need to update our policy. It's an oversight from us. We do have employees at in um, India. This may be, this is far fetched because if you have employees in India, the first thing you will do is change your policies to include India in your region, in your geographic, right? So let me give another example. Or maybe um, the hiring process says in uh, every employee will undergo a background check, but we realize that there are some people who are actually working before the background check is given. This is also something that actually happened. It turned out that in India, it takes longer, but we needed the people. So we did do a quick background check. We check, we brought them on board before we did. That's an, a risk we, the company, accepted, right? So external auditors will record all of these um, response from manage, management. So if you're skimming, if you're reviewing SOC reports, you're not going to look at all these management response and the ones that are actual accepted response, you will create it as a findings and have a meeting with the vendor to say, here are the findings, even the ones that they gave a good management response. It's still okay if you want to still talk to them about it and say, show me out of us. This is what we see. Are you mitigating it? Have you already mitigated it? Or are you in process? If you're in process, what are the plans? So, um, and I think that's it. Um, that's it about SOC reports. So, um, I hope this video was helpful. I wasn't able to attach uh, a sample SOC report, but if you go on Google and you type in sample SOC report, you can get a sample and follow with what I'm saying. I found a couple, but um, I'm not such a YouTuber. I don't know which is what is allowed and what's not allowed. The company had their name on it. I, w I thought of blurring it out, but I don't want any trouble. Just Google samples of two type two. You will see what I'm talking about. And then you listen to this video and it can make it very easy. I hope this video made sense. And if you have any questions about sub two type two, or if you don't even know why we request sub two type two, meaning you're very new to all these things, let me know and I'll go into details what SOC reports are, when to request for them, and um, how long to keep them, how to go through your own company's SOC um, certification processes. And I will see you in my next video. Thank you for stopping by.